just a minute. We got a few more directors. I think. Everybody is handling the cold pretty well. Uh, and uh, real quick, uh, just some, some things. If you make sure you turn off your phones to silent during this meeting, we'd appreciate that very much. All right, it's, I'm going to uh, open the meeting for the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority. It's 8:33. We're going to do a, a bit of a new tradition here um, that our uh, Mr. Rendon brought up, which I thought was a fantastic idea. And that to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, we'd like to have a veteran do that. And today in the audience, we have J.J. De La Cedra. Mr. De La Cedra is a Marine veteran. He served in Iraq in 20, or 2003 and again in 2004 during Operation Phantom Fury. He is currently the Director of Veteran Services and is also the Veteran Service Officer for Nueces County. He also oversees the operations and management of the Coastal Bend State Veteran Cemetery. Mr. De La Cedric, will you please come forward and lead us in the pledge, sir? And thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. <coughs> please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, Ms. Marisa, would you please call the roll, ma'am? Here. Ana Rivera. Here. 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 We please have our safety breathing, Mr. Esparza. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is John Esparza. I'm the safety and security administrator here for the CCRTA, and today I'll be giving you a short safety briefing. In the event of an emergency, we will exit the boardroom to my right, your left, proceed to the west stairwell. We will go down to the first floor and exit through the west side doors. Once outside, we will continue towards the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. Marisa will account for all the board members out. I will be the last one out to ensure that everyone gets out safely. Three things to remember during the emergency. Please do not use the elevator. Please do not return until the all clear has been given. And if we need to shelter in place, we will do so in the west side stairwell. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Ms. Marisa, do we have any receipts of the conflict of interest affidavits? There were no receipts. Thank you, ma'am. Opportunity for public comment. Just a reminder that we have a three minute limit and none of the uh, directors can uh, directly address any of your questions during that time. Do we have anybody on the public comment list? There were none online, um, but there are a few signed up in person. Um, the first is Isabel 
Ariaga with FTGG. Um, hello, uh, my name is Isabel Araiza, A R A I Z A, uh, and I'm with For the Greater Good. Um, I just wanted to come and talk about how uh, I would like for the RTA to discontinue the hostile architecture that we're seeing contaminate the entire uh, Corpus Christi area as somebody who's actually relied on public transportation for three years. Um, I understand that it can be frustrating um, to, you know, uh, or to not have those spaces available. You're trying to prevent people from laying down on the benches. You know, but the reality is that those um, bars really don't do anything in terms of um, helping people meet the needs that they have. If houselessness is an issue, then I think you all would be better served using your social, political, and economic capital, capital to engage with um, the city of Corpus Christi to actually to address the issue of houselessness. The money that's used to put those bars on the um, benches could be much better served by actually having benches at um, the bus stops, having cover when people are sitting down, having toilets so that people can use the bathroom. There are way more humane things that you can do to actually serve the public that needs the transportation than put those things out there to remind people that you all perceive that there are some people that are worthy of dignity, like with this fancy building and those special protocols that you have to announce where there's an exit sign right there and you could do without that performance. You could actually use your resources to serve the community and not serve yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Who else do we have? Marisa next. Eduardo Canales with FTG. Good morning, directors. Good, good, good morning, Mr. Canales. Hey, just for the record, could you tell us what FTGG is? For the greater good. For the greater good. Okay. It's a thank grassroots you, organization. Appreciate uh, that much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eduardo Canales. I reside in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, I want to uh, echo the comments of the previous speaker in terms of uh, the hostile agri uh, architecture that is being used and all the benches. I, I did a, a survey from all the way from Yorktown all the way over here on Staples. And not one of those benches was, all of those benches had these bars. So I, 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 I want to reiterate that it's very important that you utilize the resources that RTA, the taxes that you have in terms of being very, very more, more proactive regarding the issue of the unhoused. This is not a, a solution to it, you know, and, and using the taxes that you have, uh, you know, in terms of, of it, doesn't, it doesn't really, you know, uh, aid the cause regarding the fact that um, people are unhoused. It's, it really doesn't do anything. All you're trying to do is just prevent people from sitting on the benches and, and laying on the benches. I mean understanding the, the crisis that exists in this country, you know, having almost a million people that are um, unhoused all over the country, what is the solution that RTA, proactive solution that RTA has, has put forward? I don't think you have done anything in that regard. This is it's very cruel, it's very callous, I mean, for people to, you know, when they wander around all night or wander around during the day in terms of where to rest their weary head. And I just think that this is something that, uh, that is wrong. And I, I really have looked at those things and it really doesn't serve a purpose to any degree. I mean, you're not separating people. You're not doing anything except um, using your funds here at RTA that, uh, to punish people, really, in terms of punishing the unhoused. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Canales.
Mariah Boone with Vulnerable Communities Defense League. Hello, um, I am also here to speak out against the hostile architecture that the RTA has put on benches across our city. Um, the RTA buses don't run through the night. There is really no reason why a person who's not been able to find accessible shelter should not be able to lie down and rest in the night. Uh, no one wants to sleep on a bench. No one wants to do that. The only people who are doing it are people who are barely, barely managing to survive. And to make it harder for them for no good reason is both cruel and dangerous. Sleep is necessary for survival. Also, the negative public perceptions that are generated and enforced by hostile architecture are almost as dangerous as sleep deprivation. We know that unhoused people don't commit crimes at a higher rate than the general population, except for things like sleeping in public and panhandling, which have often been criminalized in a deliberate effort to target them. Discriminatory ordinances and hostile architecture reinforce the idea that unhoused people are dangerous and different. And this decreases public empathy and increases the incidence of hate crimes against people who are unhoused. And prior to a couple of years ago when the RTA started really, really increasing its use of hostile architecture on our benches, we had very little of it in Corpus Christi. We have some in the downtown management districts areas, a very little bit, but not a lot. Most of what we have that's a hostile architecture in Corpus Christi has been implemented by the RTA. Um, we can be a better community than that. People who are unhoused need help, not discrimination, and we don't want our tax dollars or our affairs used to fund this kind of, of, of truly ugly and dangerous um, you know, spatial policy. So I really hope that you all will take those bars and dividers off the benches and be a more compassionate organization. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boone. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, oh, thank you ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Marigold Boone with Vulnerable Communities Defense League. Good morning, board members. I'm also here to talk about the RTA's use of hostile architecture um, on the Corpus Christi bus benches. So these bus stops are paid for by the citizens of Corpus Christi and should be accessible to all of us. Bars and other dividers and designs that are put in place in order to make it harder to stop and rest are discriminatory to some people with disabilities and especially the unhoused community. Targeting the vulnerable, the vulnerable people in our city by making it harder for them to rest is a cruel practice that should not be paid for with taxpayer dollars. By using hostile architecture, such as the bars that are being put on more and more of these bus benches, the city is setting a horrible example for its citizens and making it clear that instead of having empathy for people that are going through a difficult time, we should just look the other way. I urge the, RT the RTA to stop targeting our unhoused community and to please remove all of the hostile architecture that you've put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thun. Dorothy Pena. Good morning. My name is Dorothy Pena. I'm here with Further Greater Good and the Indigenous Peoples of the Coastal Bend. So I would just like to uh, ask, uh, well, good morning, <laughs> and to ask to please remove the bars and the dividers from the bus stop benches. I do not want my tax dollars to, to go towards harming uh, community members. In 2015, I find myself 
and I found myself in the unfortunate position of being houseless. And when you're houseless, there's nowhere to go. Um, you could go to the library when you're really cold, um, but you can't put your head down, you can't sleep. Um, you go to parks and you try to lay down under trees and people call the police on you. It's just a crime to not have a home. <coughs> you already feel very ostracized from your community and you're very aware that people don't want you around. So to make it even more difficult by putting these bars on bus stop benches where people just want to take a minute to rest. Just living in a way that makes you feel like you're a criminal just for existing is one of the most horrible feelings. One of the most dehumanizing feelings. And can't we just be better people to one another? It's already hard enough to just get by these days. So to feel like you already know that you're not wanted in your community, but then to have hostile architecture directly telling you, you don't, we don't even want you to take a minute to rest. We don't want you in our libraries. We don't want you in the streets, but we're not doing anything else to try to create a system that can actually help you get back on your feet. It's really discouraging. So please, please remove these bars and hear us when we're telling you if I had the choice, if I could directly say where I wanted my taxpayer dollars to go, I would tell you I want them to go to a plan that's actually focusing on helping our community members not be houseless anymore, not on things like this. Please use this money that you're using for this to go to actually coming up with a plan that will help our houseless community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pena. All right. Thank you, Melissa. The end of public comment. Uh, agenda item six: <coughs> awards and recognition. Uh, we got six A police officer of the year, Mr. Rimbaud. Good morning, everyone. This morning is an exciting uh, morning for me, uh, being involved also in the safety security department and the security detail uh, with security officers and uh, police officers that provide security for our facilities and our customers here in, in Corpus Christi. So this morning we have uh, selected the police officer uh, of the year and the security guard officer of the year. And we'll start with Sergeant uh, Michael James. Also, I wanna acknowledge before I go any further, uh, we have the uh, CCISD uh, Chief of Police, uh, Kirby uh, Warnicke, thank you for being here and also the owner of the security company, Sip Ops, Mr. Bob Lott. Sergeant Michael James is a police officer with the CCISD Police Department. Throughout his 28 years in law enforcement, he has been on the bike patrol, boat patrol, SWAT, active shooter, and firearm instructor. Officer James is married to his beautiful wife who is here today Kim, thank you for being here. And they have three uh, children, two sons and a daughter. A daughter who plays basketball at the East Texas Baptist University. And he is mostly proud of that because every so often when he has the opportunity to travel all the way to that location uh, to see his daughter play, I, I think it's awesome uh, as a parent to be really involved in, in the family. Myself, uh, when my daughter played golf, uh, she went all over the state, out of state. I was next to her, and it was a, a great moment. So I know parents, daughters go uh, a long way. Thank you. And also, his priority for working for CCRTA uh, is the safety and security of our customers, employees, and this community. Thank you, and congratulations for being the Officer of the Year for CCRTA. We have um, Lieutenant Sandra Lee. Sandra Lee has worked for SEP Ops for three years. She started out as a security officer, and based on her performance, she was hand selected for promotion to sergeant, supervised uh, five 
security officers working at the Nueva County Courthouse, which is a very strict uh, security checkpoint entering the courthouse when they go to the courtroom. You know, they gotta make sure that they don't have any weapons or anything like that that would hurt uh, somebody. Her performance indicated she was more than capable of handling any leadership duties assigned. So she again promoted to lieutenant and moved to the CCRTA to serve and to serve and uh, supervise the 14 security officers working in six different locations. Over the course of last year alone, she has been directly responsible for training, supervising of more than 30 different security officers and tolling over 3,500 3, hours of supervised security guard operations. She's the mother of seven, six sons and a daughter. Now that's a big task right there. <laughs> Um, the reasons this, this officers were selected as officer of the year, security officer of the year, is because they stand out in their, in their workforce here. Uh, I know as director also of, of uh, safety and security, it is the very important to have good officers that are, uh, love their job and they do it very well. So again, congratulations for being this um, two outstanding officers for CCRTA. Do you all want to say a, a couple of words? Well, first, thank all of y'all for allowing me to be here. Uh, Mr. Mardone, I'd like to start with you. Um, thank you for the opportunity that you've provided me to uh, work for RTA, um, and also the, the honor of being recognized for my efforts and my job. That uh, means a lot to me. RTA, thank you all for not only the opportunity that you provide for me and my fellow officers, but the, this extra job provides more than you know for not just me, but for our families at home. And that is greatly appreciated. Um, I would like to recognize my chief for being here um, during this time to uh, help me receive this honor because I not only represent y'all, I also represent him. Um, I would like to thank my wife. You know, she's the strong force behind me at home and while I'm at work. and. If y'all knew what journey she had to make to get here this morning, it was, it's really cool. <laughs> and I don't want to forget Mr. Esparza in the back. That guy has just been a true hand too as well. He's always keeping us in line and telling us where he needs us to go. So thank y'all very much. I appreciate all that you do for us and the other officers that I work with. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you, RTA board members, Mr. Esparza, Mr. Rendon, Mr. Lott, Nick, uh, it is immensely humbling and I am completely grateful to receive this incredible uh, award. I am honored, to say the least. Um, being an officer for RTA comes with its challenges. Every day we are challenged, but we are up for the challenges. I am dedicated to, actually, we are dedicated, my officers, my team of officers that work with me, every day we are dedicated to serving and protecting and keeping our environment safe. We are committed to RTA, its board members, its customers, its tenants, and its surrounding. Our priority is to keep you guys safe, and we do it with pride, and we come up and we are motivated to meet the challenges that we have in front of us daily. Thank you so much again. I completely appreciate this honor. Thank you, Lieutenant. This, I think she needs an honor just for that many boys. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, but one thing, Mike, real quick. Uh, one thing, you know, uh, y'all are the first ones we see when we get here, and you're the last ones we see when we leave, and we really appreciate everything. You guys are always very professional with a smile on your face. And I just want to say, as chairman, is thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank you. They will get, a, of course, a, uh, a really nice uh, plaque and uh, certificate, uh, along with a $100 gift cards uh, at the local uh, stores here. Thank you. Go down there. Thank you, guys. Thank you again. Thank you. Come on, y'all. Let's get a picture.
one, two, three. One, two, three. Thanks so much. Congratulations. Thank you. Again, congratulations. Uh, now, this uh, the RTA business agenda item seven discussion and possible action to approve the board minutes of the board of directors meeting of January 11, 2023. You've had the meeting minutes in your packets. Any, uh, do I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion by Director Wilbright. Second. Uh, sec a second by Director Coleman. Any further discussion, additions, deletions? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. <coughs> Agenda item eight, discussion and possible action to approve the proposed 2022-2023 RTA legislative agenda. Uh, Mr. Rendon or Mr. Munoz, would you take the lead on that, please? Sure, no problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's go over briefly the, uh, obviously we're not going to go over the whole thing, but I'll hit the <laughs> highlights of really the four main points that we're going to be getting across, uh, our four main objectives we're going to be uh, shooting to achieve over the next legislative session. Uh, one really is, uh, a, you know, a big one, as you know, uh, as the community knows, well, a lot of what we do is evacuations, emergency management in that area. Uh, so one of the big things we're going to be pushing for uh, as, you know, keeping with that theme of being a reliable partner and a community partner in times of emergency is uh, allowing other public uh, political subdivisions the opportunity to use our compressed natural gas in times of declared emergency for whatever, if they need vehicles uh, for, you know, to, whether to maintain city services, whatever the case may be, uh, and then for us to be able to recoup those costs, uh, recoup that uh, at cost. Uh, without losing our tax exempt status. Uh, so that, that's really our big one. I won't get into the weeds on it. Uh, the second one, obviously, um, you know, our affairs are a big deal, being able to uh, have a, we want to, you know, introduce some legislation that will allow us to have a little bit more control over the adjustment of affairs. One of the big reasons why, as we all know, with our FTA, applica FTA application, uh, it's one of the things that we're evaluated on. And so we just want uh, a little bit more flexibility uh, uh, to be able to do that in the current process doesn't allow us to do that. Uh, and then lastly, getting into, you know, uh, just kind of just briefly on the defensive measures, uh, anything that we can do to preserve any funding, uh, either from uh, TCEQ or for electric vehicles specifically, um, that's going to continue to allow us to pursue uh, alternative fuel uh, and, and clean energy uh, opportunities for the RTA. So in a nutshell, without getting uh, into the weeds on a lot of these issues, uh, that's kind of uh, pretty much what the big highlights of our legislative agenda are for this session. Uh, uh, Mr. Bell, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add uh, to, to those items. Great. Hang, hang on real quick. Uh, Mr. Bell, would you like to add anything? Uh, well, no, you've covered it very well. I think the, the, the good news is we're not in a budget deficit. The, the RTAs are often under attack by the legislature whenever they're looking for money. And uh, this year they had to fix that. So hopefully we'll be able to provide some more of that for our state. And we ought to just you know, continue to try to keep, keep our independence and our ability to continue to serve the public safety. Great. Thank you, Mr. Bell. I think it's a $30 billion surplus this year. Any questions from any of the directors? And just one last yes, question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma um, we kind of talked about with Aaron and his job working through this. I know it's been a real effort to try, but 
just to for us to do our outreach with our constituents here in the county and the city um, we can do it ourselves i'm happy to but we're going to confine this to some bullets which we're going to reach out i had thought you wanted to approve that with our lobbyists but if not i'm happy to go forward with my own outreach that, that's that's fine okay. you, you, you were there you, i think you have okay. the, the spiel down yeah. <laughs> so okay. but that's it fine. would be nice if we had some bullet points and i can uh, yeah, I can work with Tris on that. Yeah, give you it know. Tris. Get us the four main points. Definitely. That way we can hand it out to the entire board. So if they get asked, if they've got a hip pocket, mm -hmm. something to go over. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Good. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Any other questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain the motion. Second, Mr. Chair. I ask Madam Secretary made the motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Director Munoz. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, agenda item nine, discussion of possible action to award a five-year contract with Equans, I-N-E-O, Cistrans USA, Inc. for a bus CAD AVL system. Mr. Saldana, you have the floor, sir. Good morning. Before I start, we have uh, Stefan, our, the CEO from Equans, in our audience. So this um, lines up with the board priority of innovation. Just kind of some of our background in here. Um, we are looking to replace our computer-aided dispatch, our CAD, uh, AVO, Automatic Vehicle Location System. Um, our current system has been in place since 2009. And Robert, would you do me a favor and put yes, the sir. microphone a little closer? All right. So um, our current system has been in place since 2009. Um, Clever Device is our current vendor. Um, Digital Recorders Incorporated was the primary vendor and I'll show you a little bit later here in 2012, uh, Clever Device was bottomed out at some point in time. We have the Clever Device um, product on 65 of our fleet buses right now. Um, the Equans, we have 29 of them in our smaller buses and eight on our on big buses as well, on the system that we're looking to go to now. Our current system is a computer-aided dispatch, um, automatic vehicle location. It helps control the vehicle announcements. So when you get to the corner of Staples and Everhart, it'll make some type of statements, um, announcements for those that are uh, sight impaired and what have you. Um, our, it controls our bus interior signage. It tracks on-time performance, provides adherence uh, notifications, um, uh, digital messaging, um, our vehicle emergency alarms, and some real-time data information. It'll provide those to a lot of our apps and, and planners. So again, the system has been in place since 2012, actually 2009. Um, it's met its useful life of electronics already, you, you know, typically last five to seven years. Um, the bus scheduling system currently right now is vendor dependent. And basically what that means is when we want to make changes, the vendor has to do a lot of the changes for us. We don't have control of it ourselves. And in one of the later slide, on this slide, the last bullet point here, as we move more and more to the cloud hosting system, we want to have a little bit more control ourselves to be able to do things on the fly as opposed to waiting for a vendor to have to do things for us. Uh, what we're looking for is a, a modern open uh, data sharing system, freely available uh, to interface with other systems. Uh, obviously, we want a state of the art as we move to our cloud-based system. The replacement of this covers five major areas. It hopefully, it'll improve uh, on-time performance, improve dispatch reliability and efficiency, improve scheduling and planning, improve our data management and reporting, and hopefully with all those in there, it'll help improve our, our ridership. The RFP was issued October 6th. Uh, the RFPs were due uh, December 8th. We received five proposals. Uh, we scored all these proposals on the technical uh, scores that we have in here. Our technical and functional was 35 points. Project management was 25 points. And qualifications is 20 points. From there, we took the five. We, we uh, analyzed them in here and evaluated them here. And then we found three that were in a competitive range, and we ended up setting up interviews and demos for the three that were in the competitive range, which is the Equans, Avail, and then our current provider, Clever Device. As you can see, the totals in here, uh, it was close when we took a look at all the scoring between the pricing and the, the technical side, and Equans, you know, so, uh, Trans Systems was uh, what we deemed the overall best value for our system. There is no DBE goal for this, and the funds are provided through the 2021 and 2022 CIP at 8020 match, and it's a formula funds of 5339 grants. 
We have a project budget of $2,171,500, and the five-year cost for our system uh, comes out to $2,036,605.80. So we're about $100,000 uh, under budget, a little over $100,000 under budget. So staff requests the Board of Directors authorize a Chief Executive Officer or designee to award a contract to Equines Enos Tran uh, System Trans USA Incorporated for five-year contract for bus CAD AVL system in amount not to exceed $2,036,605.80. And I will take any questions you may have. Any questions for Robert? Let me put my glasses on so I can see what I'm looking at. <laughs> Director Wilbright. I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. So currently we're using the same system in a smaller percentage of the buses? Correct. We're using two systems right now, which obviously systems will do in here, but we would like to have one system if possible. That way we have, uh, we don't have redundancy of parts and everything else that we have around here, and it's easier to control one system than two. So two questions. Is the, I'm assuming it is, but I just want to make sure, is the performance of that system better than the other one? The, um, the 29 that we've had now, we've had it for a little while here, and we've had no problems with it. It's been great. Um, it is help, it's a lot more friendly with the cloud system that we have. It's not been independent like it is, so it's a, to us, as we evaluated it, it, it was a better system. And the good thing for this is when we do transitions, we have the history of those 29 plus the eight big buses already. So with 37 buses, we've had the experience with it to know the product is, is a good product. Okay. Uh, second one is how's the cost comparison? When you take a look at the overall cost, um, on the three Equans uh, was one of the lowest of the costs in here, which helped or the 20 point system in here to get them over as, as overall best value. All three systems we felt could do the job. We felt Equans was the best overall value for it. Okay. Any other questions for Robert? Uh, yes, Director Mamie. Is this the system that has been um, in testing? Yes, ma'am. Um, those eight, those 29 we started off, we started off with a, a pilot program and then we moved uh, the 29 to the smaller vehicles where we use for the for the paratransit, it's a fixed route, but like the paratransit style vehicle, and the eight big buses, we moved into a, a pilot program with that as well. So is this the technology that's just inside the vehicles, or is this also um, on, at the Bear Lane location? Like it's, the monitors it's, it does both in there for the dispatchers in there to help court, um, talk to each other on their court, so. And, and is this the one when we did the tour um, on the computer screens that they were it that's that's the uh, the CAD system in there, yes, ma'am. Well, you're but this is this one. Yeah, yes, that is great. Well, you're running both of them on there. So, uh, clever device and this we're running on there. That's why you have multiple of the screens on there. So this is the newer one. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? Here, none. I'll entertain a motion. So um, moved. Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Director Coleman. I'll second. Okay, we've got a second by uh, Madam Vice Chair. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Gabby. All right, agenda item 10, a discussion of possible action to review and recertify the reserve policy. <laughs> one of our favorites. All right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. This is one of the 23 board policies in here. So this is uh, goes with the board priority of public image and transparency. Uh, just before I start off, our, our policy is staying intact. We're just adding some language in it to reinforce some of the verbiage that in the policy in there. So there's no real big changes in the policy in here. Our current policy states that the RTA will maintain adequate uh, reserve levels uh, and it'll be funded through um, our unrestricted portion of our, of our monies that we have. Um, it's here to mitigate and, and hedge uh, future risk to ensure that we can have adequate resources to provide services uh, to the community. Also, the policy states that the board shall review and approve on an annual basis the reserve accounts and the methodology for funding these reserve accounts. So our three reserve accounts are the operating reserve, capital reserve, and employees benefit reserve. Our operating reserve states that um, it'll, it'll be funded through 25% of the budget expenses, less depreciation. Our capital reserve is 25% of our capital budget including the rollover. So that a rollover is any product that maybe not been finished the prior year and that rolled over into the current year. Um, at, or 25% depreciation to whichever is greater. And then employee benefits reserve is um, expected to be funded for the annual amortized cost of our underfunded accrued liability for a defined benefit pension plan, as well as 20% of our annual um, insurance cost. And our annual insurance cost over the last five years is about $3 million. It's about $600,000, $620,000 or so. 
So we're looking to reserve, uh, keep our, our three reserves that we have in here as well as uh, the way we calculate the method for the reserves. So some of the verbiage changes that we have in here, we're looking to make sure that we can identify the primary risk for each of these. On the operating reserve, obviously the primary risk is the volatility of our sales tax. Um, in years of down sales tax, we want to make sure we have this reserves to help us get us through. Our capital reserve is here to cover our local match plus a three-day float. So typically when you finish your project, you're going to the government system computer, you'll say that you finished it, show your, your evidence of it, you'll pay your, your project off, and then within about a three-day period, they pay you back your federal portion back, which is anywhere from 50 to 80%, 85% of your portion back. So you want to make sure you cover that float quick period of time. Employee a benefits reserve is to shield us from the impacts of the economy and effects of employee benefits. So two of the hardest things to project when you're doing a budget is sales tax and employee benefits. You're not sure how people are going to get, if people get sick or not. So you want to make sure that you have that reserve in case you have a, a year where you have a little bit higher medical costs than usual. Our second, we want to be able to say how we're going to replenish this. So if we have to dip into reserves, what's our strategy to, to replenish it here? We want to make sure that um, we'd have to say, we'd like it to say that at least you want to replenish it to the beginning of the fiscal year, so what you budgeted for. On the third, you want to make sure that uh, you want to say what you're funding these for. So the effective dates of the replenishment, you want to be able to say if this replenishment is either from a temporary basis you're pulling the money out or a permanent basis. And then you want to make sure that the only of the three reserves that we have that really restricted for us is if you look at chapter 451, it says our operating reserve has to be funded at least with two months of actual operating expenses, which is about 16, 17%. Our current policy states 25%, so we go above and beyond. Right. If we ever want to adjust any of these here, we have to make sure we stay within the chapter 451 of this one here and stay at 16, 17% as a, as a floor level. So we're looking to ratify a reserve policy um, and continue funding these reserves with prescribed methodology um, with the following changes that we had just, with the changes that we just discussed. So at this time, staff request the board of directors adopt the resolution for the proposed changes to reserve policy as well as recertify the designation of reserves from the unrestricted uh, portion of our fund balance and uh, approve the methodologies for determining these fund funding levels. So I'll take any questions you may have. Before we take questions, um, one thing I like the 25 percent. Yes, sir. Uh, but uh, Mike, can you make sure, since uh, just a reminder to everybody, the board of directors we're all fiduciaries, mm -hmm. and uh, make sure everybody's training's up to date uh, online. Just a reminder uh, of that. Um, it's online training, so you have to take a little test and all that. So just a reminder uh, for that. Any questions for Robert? <coughs> yes, sir. I have a question for Dan. Okay. Uh, give me one second. I got Director Will right now. I'll take your question, uh, Gabby. She can go first. Okay, Gabby, he deferred to you. Go ahead, please. Okay, I just need to know how do we make sure we're up to date? I think I've done everything, but I don't know if there's anything new that's come out. Uh, that's why I wanted Mr. Rendon to make sure he pushes out where everybody's at in their level of training. I think it's online, and it shows you all the modules you've completed and, or not completed. So I just wanted an update on that. Yeah, we'll, we'll check that in and call everybody individually, and, and uh, if they need the training, we'll, we'll get it for you guys. Uh, it's just Thank an email you, that you go that. to the link, and, yeah. Yeah, and you check it, yeah. Okay, uh, is that all, uh, Director Canales? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Director Wilbright. Okay, on the three policy changes you mentioned, I think it was back, I believe it was third or fourth slide, somewhere in that ballpark? Turn on your mic. Uh, Sorry, it's on. I'm just Mike, too man. far away from it. Okay. So that's the beginning of yeah, these three. Mm -hmm. The employee benefits reserve, you mentioned uh, health care stuff, but you also said economic uncertainties. Mm -hmm. What are those benefits covering? So our employee reserve is covering all our, our medical costs as well as the unfunded portion of our um, liability for our pension plan, the fund okay. benefit pension plan. So as the market goes up and down and the level of funding goes, um, the board made a policy that we want to be somewhere in the range of, I think it was um, 85 to about 95% in there. So as, as goes down, that money's right here to float it in here. Yep. Uh, other question then is what's the changes to these numbers to cover these three things? There is no change. We're just adding some verbiage to say that in the past, we have never really had to go dip into it. 
the person that I am and my finance director are, we want to have, make sure we have verbiage in that if we ever have to, we are able to start to identify some of these things here. Because we never sat there and said if we, if we dipped into it, would we have to replenish it in that given year or a time period for that year. So and we already have all this money in there. there. We yes. don't need to add anything. No, this sir. is just policy for what's already there. Every budget year, we, we have that in there as line items for our budgets. Right. As well as we also, these are what RPTA self-imposes in Chapter 451 to some degree for the benefit side of it here. Um, we also have our bonding. Uh, so we put another $1.6 or so away for our bond payments for the, each year between the principal and, and, and there. So it's another, another, but it's not part of the board policy. Perfect. I just didn't know if we were having to modify the budget heavily to match these policies, but that worked. No, sir. Robert, uh, just for the benefit of the directors, could you mm -hmm. go over the, uh, uh, I don't know if we call it unfunded liabilities or liabilities in the pension plan and, uh, and where the board, I guess that was three or four years ago, where we, instead of, instead of being where most uh, public entities are underfunded by, you know, they're at sitting at 60 or 65 percent. Yes, um, we decided to go between, I think, 85 and 95 percent, depending 95, on yes, market sir. conditions. Correct. Could you just do a 30-second elevator speech on that for us? Okay. Please? So let me start off with, with your statement here. So year in and year out, we are one of the best-funded pension plans in here. So we're all... As fiduciaries, you should sit and be able to sleep a little better at night for that. Um, our unfunded portion of it here is, as the market goes up and down, we have monies that we have in a funded account for a defined benefit. So our pension plan has a couple of different things in here. There's a defined benefit plan where we put 2% a year for every year that you work, and we take an average of the last three years. So just simple numbers. If you made 90,000, 100,000, 110,000 in your last three years of work, and you worked your 20 years, you get 2% a year for 20 for the 20 years, so you get 40% of $100,000. So you get $40,000 for the rest of your life, whether it's one year after you retire or 40 years after you retire. That's defined benefit. We have a defined contribution plan in there, too, where we put monies aside because we're not in part of Social Security, so we put money aside for that part as well, as well as the employee can do a little bit more to get you up to a 10% in there. And those are the two main ones. We also have a couple other plans that you can put money in yourself if you want to, um, if, if you want to put more money aside for that. The unfunded portion of it here depends on really on the market. We're usually funded around the 95 to 100 percent. Um, if we're having a bad market year, uh, you might dip down below that. And the board, what we had set there and said at one time is if we go below an uncomfortable level of 85 percent, then they take what they call a smoothing. Instead of saying, your 85% now represents, to get you to 85%, you have to put in $400,000 in there and, and put the system to shock. They take a smoothing and they, they amortize it over a period of time in here. So it, it's not such a shock in there. Because if you put money in and you get funded 105%, you can't take money out and just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to take that 5% out. Once it's in there, it's in there. And that can then restrict some degree how much operations you have in here. So you want to, we did that smoothing there so it's not a panic mode of when the market goes down because we know. The market usually goes down and goes up. And over a period of time, the market makes money, obviously, in there. So um, we have a smoothing effect that we have to kind of shield us from that. So the unfunded side is just to make sure that we're at the comfort level of 85 to 95 percent. And I think last year, when we finished, we were somewhere around that 94 and a half percent, somewhere in there, because the market wasn't that good this last year. Thank you. But even in a market that was down, we were still we're still well. funded. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, That's Robert. not trying to get too technical. It's no. just any questions for Robert? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Uh, I have a motion by Director Wilbright. Second. Second by Madam Secretary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. same sign. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Agenda item 11, discussion and possible action to award a three-year contract to Minnesota Life Oaks, Inc. for life insurance and accidental death and dismemberment. Good morning. Gaetan, good morning. Angelina Gaitan, Director of Human Resources. This falls under a board priority of transparency. A little bit of background. We do offer uh, group life and accidental death and dismemberment coverage at no cost to the employees. Maximum amount coverage is a $100,000 policy. Employees are able to uh, obtain voluntary purchase, additional supplemental coverage for spouse and children um, and for themselves. And this 
premium is paid by the employee. Minnesota Life currently administers our life insurance products since 2012. Our current contract expires March 13th of this year, and it's very important for our employees to have uh, life insurance available for unexpected incidents that occur. We did issue out the RFP on October the 13th with proposals due on November the 10th. We did receive six proposals. Two were deemed unresponsive. And the criteria that we evaluated was approach and work plan at 40 points, qualifications and reference 15 points, experience 15 points, price score 30 points with a maximum score of 100. Minnesota Life, Blue Cross, Blue Shield of Texas, Reliance Standard Life Insurance and Life Insurance Medical Group Management were the four that we did evaluate. Minnesota Life did come in at 92.74 points. This is an annual basis uh, cost estimate of approximately 98,342. It's 100% uh, budgeted within individual operating budgets. The cost is split between the RTA and employee uh, an employee voluntary cost. The CCRTA estimates 58,040 for their portion and employee volunteer products are estimated at 40,302. <clears throat> Staff requests the Board of Directors to authorize the Chief Executive Officer or designee to award a three-year contract to Minnesota Life for life insurance and accidental death and dismemberment. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Questions for Angelina? I just have a comment. Yes, sir. I just want to compliment staff, Gaitan and, and Robert, on the previous uh, contract that we are getting multiple proposals. You know, I know that sometimes we get complacent with the people we've been using for years, mm -hmm. but we also should allow other people the opportunity to submit proposals. And I'm very, very uh, proud of our staff for moving in that direction. I see more and more multiple proposals for whatever it is, whether it's insurance for cars or health insurance and this one here. I mean, y'all did your due diligence and I really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you, Director Salasad. Any other questions for Angelina? Hearing none, I'll, I'll entertain a motion. I have a motion by Director Sully. Second. Second by Director Maney. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. This time I, I have to leave for another appointment, so I'm going to turn over the uh, oops, the meeting to Madam Vice Chair and, and staff. Thank you very much. Good job again as usual. Really proud of you guys, and, and I'll be back next time. <laughs> thank you guys. Um, moving on to item 12, discussion and possible action to confirm appointments of chairperson of RTA's Committee on Accessible Transportation, Ms. Montes. Thank you so much and good morning. Sharon Montes, Managing Director of Capital Programs and Customer Services. Today is our item for our RCAT chair position. Um, so just a little bit of background. And let me take a moment to go ahead and say uh, we have Mrs. Imelda Trevino in the audience this morning. Thank you for being here. Um, so basically, the process for the selection and confirmation of RCAT members is outlined in the RCAT bylaws. Uh, the chairperson for RCAT is appointed by the chairperson for the RTA Board of Directors. The chairperson shall be the presiding officer for the committee and serves at the pleasure of the RTA Board. The recommended appointment for the chairperson of RCAT committee is Mrs. Uh, Imelda Trevino. She's currently an RCAP member. She currently works as a student hire ability navigator, which services as a liaison between Texas Workforce Commission, Vocational Rehabilitation Services, and the community. The purpose of that position is to improve access to improvement and training services and increase employment opportunities for job seekers with disabilities focusing in on services for students with disabilities who are in the early phases 
of preparing for a transition to post-secondary education and employment. Other of the aspects of the position include convening partners, including school districts and the education service centers to discuss successful strategies and services, gaps and opportunities for collaboration. Developing and or disseminating information to increase community and system awareness of the resources while increasing student and family awareness of and access to pre-employment transition services. Also, identifying community partners and establishing collaborative relationships. Other items worth noting, uh, she was recently recognized as one of three mentors for the Student Hireability Navigator Program in, Tex in Texas. She serves on the City of Corpus Christi's Community for Persons with Disabilities, and she serves on the Health and Human Services Commission Direct Service Workforce Development Task Force. Statewide task force explores long-term recruitment and retention strategies within the community, which she brings a voice for persons with disabilities. At this point, I would like to request that the board confirm the appointment of Ms. Imelda Trovino as the chair of RTA's Committee on Accessible Transportation. That concludes my presentation. Madam Chair. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Is there a motion to confirm the appointment of Ms. Imelda Trevino so as the chair of RTA's <laughs> Committee on Accessible Transportation? Thank you, Mr. Salazar. Second. Thank you, Director Mamie. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion Aye. carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Congratulations. Thank you for your service. Moving on to item 13, update on RCAT committee activities, Ms. Montes. Thank you. So the items that I presented at our last RCAT committee, committee uh, was the November and December CEO's report inf information. And they enjoy getting that because that summarizes what we've been performing and outreaching at the RTA. Also updated on the final plan for the long range system plan that was presented to the board we discussed the public engagement that was held, alternatives to improve short and long range mobility, and the ADA CRTA bus stop analysis that they uh, commented on. Also provided an update on the November 2022 operations report and the Beeline metrics report. And here is a snapshot. Um, met all the metrics um, except for November, but the overall average was uh, within the standard. Um, wheelchair boardings for the month of November, 3,461. Upcoming RCAP meetings, February 16th, March 16th, and April 20th. And that completes my presentation, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Montes? Moving on to item 14, committee chair reports. We'll start with administration and finance. Director Canales. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we did not have a meeting. Uh, it was canceled on January the 25th or the 27th. As a result, there's no new updates on uh, our committee meeting. Thank you. Um, operations and capital projects, um, Director Salazar. None other than, uh, again, I want to reiterate my, my, my staff's compliment on making sure that we get proposals from more than one vendor on everything we do. Thank you. Thank you, sir. A rural and small cities, Director Allison. Nothing today. Oh, I do have a question for Director. Um, and I'm sure you're gonna get to this at some point, but the follow-up on the city of Puerto Ranges um, replacement of that bus, that conversation we had with the mayor. So shortly afterwards, I'm assuming she, she called TechStop because TechStop reached back out to us and they gave us the approval for that stop and for one that's going to be on Saratoga by WellMed. And that, so there are specific requirements of the type of poll that you have to have. So we're awaiting parts and it may be here Friday if the, part, if the base that we need, because it needs to be a breakaway assembly. If it comes in Friday, then we're going to be installing the bus stop out there in front of the... Um, the The, the bus replacements so those will be built over these next few months okay. and that's we, we've got I just got back from Indiana and all the snow last okay. week 
it, and that, so we've got one set that will start getting built in um, the uh, beginning of February, about say midway in. Those are specific to paratransit. And then we have another set of vehicles that will start getting built in the March time frame, and that will contain the other vehicles that will replace the ones in Port the other two in Port Aransas. Legislative Director Buñoz, any updates? Uh, so, uh, as we all know, about 30 minutes ago, we approved our uh, legislative agenda, just uh, <laughs> uh, formally. But we've been working with our uh, with our lobbyists and with Mr. Bell on drafting and getting uh, the bills that we wanted in place. Also, um, uh, we met with uh, recently. We took a trip up to Austin. The uh, uh, Chairman Leindecker, myself, uh, Secretary Allison. Um, <clears throat> we met, and um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rendon as well. We met with our, our lobbyists there, and we also had very productive meetings uh, with um, uh, Representative Herrero's uh, uh, chief of staff. We met with uh, Morgan Lamantia, uh, Senator Morgan Lamantia, Senator Juan Chuino Hossa, uh, Representative uh, Jam Lozano, uh, Representative Todd Hunter, of course. Um, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. I think that's everyone. Yeah, I don't want <laughs> to leave anyone on. out. But yeah, and uh, we had a lot of very, very positive response on the things that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, no objections. The lawmakers are very excited uh, to kind of see the, change, the, the proposed changes to the law that we're making. And so we have a lot of support from our home delegation there uh, up in Austin as well. And so uh, over the next few months, we're going to continue to uh, you know, build and advocate, uh, build the, you know, uh, uh, more of the, of the stronger presence there and continue to advocate on the issues that are very important to us uh, as we go through the re remainder of the session. And uh, if there are any things, defensive issues that come up, obviously I'll report to the board and make you aware of those things so that you're all uh, well informed of the things that we're doing up in Austin. So thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, moving on to item 15, presentations, December 2022 financial report. Director, I mean, Mr. Saldana. All righty. So this uh, lines up with the uh, public image and transparency priority. So some of the highlights for December, the bus advertisement came in over 155% of baseline. Um, our investment income is doing well um, on baseline with the high interest rates that we have right now. Um, and Stable Street Center leases were over 505% of baseline. So the second column is what we're looking at here, December actuals. Our total revenues come in at $4.2 million on a budget of 4.95. Expenses come in at 3.63 on a budget of almost 3.8, so about a $587,000 of positive cash flow. And um, when you take a look at the total revenues, the, the, the reason why we're down a little bit is because we receive we pulled down our federal grant money in advance. So early in the year, we pull that money down and in the back end, you see that we have a, a shortfall for that month, but we're overall in good shape. So here's revenues, like I said. Obviously all the revenues you would like to see at 100% or better on the far right-hand column. Uh, the only one that is below, it, well, there are two of them are, is the passenger services is our fares. And um, our federal state Grant, local grant assistance, we pulled that money down again earlier in the given year so we can invest it and, and see a return off it versus waiting for the month that we budget for it. So here's a breakdown of our operating revenue, revenue generated by the operation versus um, a non-operating revenue, which you could tell the lion's share of it is non-operating revenue. The operating revenue here, $87,000 and change from our passenger services, from our fares, a uh, little under $19,000 for bus advertisement, and then the $335,000 is our CNG rebate that we get back from the miles that we drive out here. And that's a combination of both federal and state monies that we get back from that. So 441,000 of operating revenues in there. Um, the non-operating revenues, the lion's share of that again is sales tax, and that is a projected number. We'll get our sales tax number next week. So. Can you uh, explain the percent? Yes, sir. Can you explain the percent to actual budget? Is the percent for for the actual budget for the for the given month compared to the year uh, budget year number? So we uh, so explain to me what the twenty four point four seven or seven four percent is over of what is that number? is for the one point seven eight two million dollars of four hundred forty one thousand dollars. So we were supposed to have operating revenues of one point seven, and we got four forty one. For, that's what we budget for the year. For the year. Yeah, we're comparing it to the year. If you look at the outside number, that is the baseline for the month. 
So yeah. the second to last column is for the year. Last column is compared to the month. So that's saying the percentage of 1.7 over the annual budget? Yeah, so the annual budget for operating revenues is $1.782 million. We received 441000 for the month, which is 24% of the annual budget. Our budget for the month was $450,000. We received four forty one, so we received 97.82% for the operating budget for the month. That just seems really high for one month. It's compared for the month. So we're comparing that 441000 to your operating budget of 450000 for the month. That's why it's 97%. No, I'm saying the 24.7 percentage number. Oh, because the lion's share of our sales tax of our C&G rebate comes back at the end of the year. That's why it's high for that one given month. The rest of the months usually are lower than that. Got it. Okay. All right. So where does the money go? Um, purchase transportation, a little under $700,000, 22%. Miscellaneous, a little over 52000 at 2%. The other supplies to keep the buses running, uh, a little under $248,000 at 8%. The COVID supplies, we don't buy COVID every month, but as we issue, when we buy, it goes into inventory, and when we issue it out, we, we get charged for it on there on the monthly budget in there. So we issued out of inventory $3,500 of COVID supplies. We continue to give masks out in the buses and what have you. Um, our wages, about 36% at a little over under $1.1 million. Benefits, 11% at 332000 almost 333000 Our services, 18% at 541000 Utilities, 2% under a little under 60000 And insurance, a little over 40, almost, a little under $49,000 at 1%. Our expenses, contrary to the uh, revenues, we want this to be under 100%, the other two line items that are over 100% are material and supplies. Um, that is from bus parts and facility services. And then our services are just a timing issue of all our professional services agreements. So we want to get them. In December, everybody's trying to get the month, their last of the year invoices in. So that line item tends to go over the last of the month there. So our year to date number, again, the, the four. Common ones here, bus advertisement, 121,000, 121% of baseline. Investment income, 2,000% of baseline. Sales tax is obviously the big one that we like to look at, 101% of baseline, so uh, had a good sales tax year, according to budget. And then the federal, state, local grant assistance is right under at 99%, 99.7% uh, of our baseline. So our actual column, the second column for the year to date, $53.3 million of total revenues on a budget of $52 million. Our total expenses come in at, uh, for the year, 43.5, almost $43.6 million on a budget of 47.5, so we're $9,731,980 of positive cash flow for the year. And I believe I mentioned most of that time here is we have received about $10, $11 million, $10 million of ARP money and then another million dollars or so of two grants that we have for preventive maintenance money. So that kind of obviously helps out, balance that out for the positive cash flow. Just line items for the, for the revenues. I don't like the month here, the passenger service is the only one under 100%, uh, percent, as well as the state and federal. We're at 99.97. So we're about a little less than $40,000 shy on the a federal statement of what we budgeted for out of an $11.5 million budget. So that was a pretty close budget there. Where the money goes, it, it kind of follows with the same year to date as the month, 22% for purchase transportation, 2% miscellaneous, 8% other, about 30% for salaries and wages, 15% for benefits, 12% for services, utilities 2%, and insurance at 2%. Our expenses, the only one that's above year to date is material and supplies with the inflation that we had in here to keep the buses rolling. We just paid a little bit more for parts and facility services this year. Our fare recovery uh, ended the year at 2.64%. Again, the percentage of our fares that pays for operational expenses. And you can see kind of the downward trend for most of the years except for 18 to 19. Just a 13 month average of what we budget, what we actually receive, and what we received the prior month for sales tax. So, November is what we show because that's the actual number. Again, December we'll get that next week. 
If you see for sales tax in November of 2021, we received $3.1 million. Um, November this year, we received 3,078,000, so 31,000 less than what we received last uh, year in, in November. We budgeted $3,014,000 and received 3,078,000, so about 63, million, $64,000 more than what we budgeted for. And I'll take whatever questions you may have. Any questions? Okay, we'll move on to um, February 2023 procurement update. Mr. Salvanian. Oh, I thought I heard someone say, excuse me. So. All right, so this uh, lines up with the board uh, image, uh, public image and transparency. The three procurements we have out is a bank restoration. Uh, this is the four RFPs that we put out. We're in the third of the four RFPs. It should come back to board in July, uh, committee in July or August, if we receive a proposal to repurpose the bank. If not, we'll issue it out again for the fourth and final six month period. Our occupational medical. Uh, with the doctor center, it's a three-year contract. We're looking for about $100,000 for the three-year period, so a little over $33,000 a year. Our general architectural engineering services, we're looking to execute the final uh, last option year, about $150,000 for that. The combined for the three is about $250,000. Under the signature authority of CEO, so $50,000 or less. HVAC services, we're looking to execute the second uh, Option year at 42,500. Our towing services, we're looking for a three-year contract at $26,700 for the three-year period. A memorandum of agreement with Poisano, who helps service some of our rural areas, uh, about $16,727 a year. Some generator services, we're looking to exercise the first option year, a little under $22,000. Memorandum, a memorandum of agreement with Real, again, another company that helps us uh, service some of our rural areas, about $34,603 a year. Our APCs, uh, we have, are looking to execute the first option year, uh, a little over $17,000, and then some commercial custodial services, looking to execute the second option year at about $33,685. So the combined for all those projects together is $193,652. Uh, and then we have a marina space at $68.40 that we have on an annual basis. Take any questions you may have. Any questions? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Thank Salvanio. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to December 22 operations report, Derek. Good morning, everyone. All right, the board priority for this is public image and transparency. For the highlights, our passenger trips were up 12.4% to 233,530. And our revenue service hours were up 3.8% to 24,507, and our revenue service miles were up 7.7%. Here you can see a trend line, as I mentioned in the last board meeting. Then in November through December, we typically dip into our lowest ridership period of the year with the holidays and most of the schools being out. Here is a, our system overall again is, was up 12.4%, but still down 41.2% compared to pre-COVID. Our fixed route system was up 11.8%, but down 43.5% compared to pre-COVID. Beeline was up 4.3% and down 13.3% compared to pre-COVID. And our FlexiB service in Port Aransas was down 4.9%, but up 66.9% compared to pre-COVID. Vanpool was up 57.2% compared to last year and uh, still up 23.5% compared to pre-COVID. And our rural services, which are Real and Pisano, were down 50% compared to last year and down 81.9% compared to pre-COVID. And our system-wide year-to-date ridership, which is essentially gonna be 2022 versus 2021, our system overall was up 18.2%, but down 46.4% compared to pre-COVID. Our fixed route system being up 17.6%, but down 48.5% compared to pre-COVID. B-line ended 18.5% up, but down 22.9% compared to pre-COVID. Our FlexiB services in Port Aransas were up 46.3% for the year and up 9.6% compared to pre-COVID. Our Vanpool services were up 37.4% for the year and up 43% compared to pre-COVID. And our rural services were down 39.3% for the year and down 73.3% compared to pre-COVID. 
Here's our quarterly cost by passenger. Our uh, van pool service still continues to be the lowest cost per passenger with our directly operated fixed route services just behind that. And then our most expensive service is the FlexiB service in Port Aransas, though over this last six months with the increased ridership, we've seen that come down to where it's more in line with our other on-demand services like V-Line and the Real and Pasano's costs. They're on time performance for our fixed route system and there's uh, no issues here. We didn't see increased in the wheelchair boardings for the month. These are the projects that were impacting our fixed route services during the month of December. And this is a list of the upcoming uh, detours or projects that will be impacting our services. And there's a potential for 57 additional bus stops being impacted. Here's our B-Line service performance. With the cold weather week that we had in December and then the holidays, we did have a lot of uh, call -in, same day call-ins again, especially the Fridays and Saturdays before the holidays, but then during, during that cold period. In the miles between road calls, there's no issues there. And again, uh, just like on the fixed route system, we did see an increase of uh, wheelchair boardings for the month. Our customer assistance forms were at seven. And it's the same number we had pre-COVID, so no, no issues there. And our miles between road call and our large bus or Gillig fleet were above our standard, so no issues here. With that, I'll take any questions that you have. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Rendon, um, the, that intersection um, at Lapan and Comanche, I know I, we had talked about it before, um, that five o'clock traffic there where that bus stop sits, um, have you all looked at that by chance? We, we did do an assessment of us on there. So uh, Sharon was looking at the right of way constraints and who owned what property there. That way we could push that, that bus stop further away from the intersection over there. So it's an in progress okay. uh, project right now. Yes, I've, I've <coughs> excuse me, I know of the um, safety concern that's at that intersection. So I myself have gone out there, visit with Ms. Sharon and Derek. So we're working to hopefully we can move it like maybe another 50 yards. Sure. Down, down the street, so okay. yeah, we're working on that. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Is that on the this side of 286, no. on the other side of 286? Yeah. You have to be careful with that because it also services Metro Ministries, that stop. It's yeah, it's, it's yeah. just, it's yeah, a yeah, very, it's backed up for sure. yeah, and yeah. the buses are there, and I, I shared with um, Mr. Rendon that um, at five o'clock, when those two buses stop, that traffic that's coming through, they just go right through and um, yeah, know, because they're, the they're going actually downhill. Right. Any of the buses there, uh, the person coming to the stop sign, they can't see, see. on the right, right side. They have to sneak into the street. So yeah, we're hoping to, to move it. Okay, thank you, sir. We'll keep you up to date. So that's thank cool. You. Moving on to October and December 22 safety and security report. Mr. Rendon. Good morning again, directors. Um, every quarter, you know, I report on on the um, safety security um, collision report and mileage. I want to acknowledge that you know it's just not uh, me that prepares this uh, report. It, it it starts with uh, with the uh, uh, trainers and planning. Uh, my administrator, uh, John Esparza, and Beth, who is in charge of risk management, uh, and then operations. So it's it's all combined uh, to get the right numbers. And then at the end, uh, we send it to marketing, make, making sure that everything looks good. And then they give the um, check mark, and then it becomes a, a document report to you guys. So it's it's not just myself, but there's a whole team of, of um, directors and uh, supervisors that provide information for this important uh, report. So just want to acknowledge uh, all that team that, that participates in this in this report. So in the month of October, December, and uh, October, November, December, three months, um, our CCR RTA uh, operators drove a total amount of 630,000. And as you can see in October, uh, colli collision rate was 2.30 uh, in November, uh, 0.98. Then in December was uh, 1.44. Okay. 
So the year-to-date collision rate is 1.39, and if you look to your left on, on the 2021, the prior year of that, it was almost identical. So we um, continue to do well in our driving and our training. Um, again, it's the safety our, of the community and our passengers that are in, the, in, in our buses. I've always said that, you know, we're not UPS or um, Federal Express, they carry packages. We carry human beings and we're uh, extremely careful on how we move uh, in this community. Uh, so you can see the a little over a thousand contacts that we had. Um, Ninety-seven percent of the top five. Uh, usually, the quality of life is uh, the highest at sixty-eight uh, percent. This is important to our customers. That, as we we saw our this morning to begin the uh, the meeting, we awarded the officer of the year and security officer. Um, they come into play our transfer stations uh, around this building. You know, they ask for directions, for help, for advice, um, you name it. Uh, it's, it's our PR that we have with our law enforcement uh, in, in the community. So um, that's, you know, that's what we do. Thank you. So our safety, uh, Staples uh, Street Center, uh, we continue to provide security as you guys know, in the morning when you guys uh, come in uh, in the building, there's a security officer there. Uh, we do that every day and then during lunch and then at the end of the day. Um, cold weather, raining, you know, we, we try to do our best to, of course, uh, stay safe with ourselves and um, make sure that this community and the, and the surrounding of the proximity around this building that they know that we have uh, police officers and security officers patrolling uh, our area. Also, our, our count uh, averages uh, right now into the building is right around 200, sometimes 190, 110, 108, uh, 208. And so when it goes up, it, it goes up on Fridays and Saturdays. And that's when we have uh, a lot of our citizens moving in, uh, out of town in Greyhound. So that creates a little bit more uh, population coming into our, our building. And then in Robstown Police Department, we're, we are very thankful for the city of Robstown providing our, the K-9 unit. And uh, we were doing it once uh, every two weeks. Now we're gonna try and do um, three times a month. Also making contact with uh, Precinct uh, uh, 5 Constable. They also have a K-9. They're going to be coming on, on board and, and adding uh, extra uh, uh, health and welfare inspections at our transfer stations. And, you know, our customers love the K-9 unit, you know, when, when it's around. So it, it's a safety um, uh, tool that we utilize. And, I, I, again, at the end, it's for safety of our um, riders, uh, customers, and employees in the community. And then our rover, we do have a, a daytime rover. Uh, sometimes when the officers uh, change every six months, they change from days to afternoons. Uh, so if they were working in the days and, and they move up to uh, afternoons or uh, midnight, send, so they can patrol in the morning. So we have pat patrols in the morning and evening and also on, on the weekends. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, item 16, Acting CEO Report. As you heard from uh, Director um, uh, Aaron Munoz, uh, we did uh, go to uh, Austin. Uh, the only thing I would want to add that we were able, we were not able to meet with ABLE <laughs> uh, because of a family uh, emergency, but we were we did meet with uh, his chief of staff, Jesse Moreno, who uh, gave us a handful and a great conversation. Uh, so it was a great, great visit in, in Austin. One thing that I want to add, um, Aaron and uh, Lynn, is that um, uh, Representative Todd Hunter um, suggested that we put our pretty faces uh, twice a month in Austin. So for that, okay. 
so the rule update, uh, we did meet uh, January the 12th. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Allison did a, a great job in, in the introduction. And then we explained to them you know, our, our services, especially uh, June 1st, the hurricane season starts. Uh, so we did uh, remind them to uh, be aware of that. And we will be meeting with all the small city mayors, uh, hopefully in the early part of May, to just uh, remind them that the hurricane the season starts in, in June the 1st, uh, all the way to November. November. And then we ex uh, told them a little bit about the five-year plan and the new bus uh, in, in Puerto Resin that's gonna come soon, right, Derek? And uh, also on reference to shelters uh, that we are providing in, uh, in the uh, small cities uh, communities. Well, this is an exciting year. <laughs> well, today is a, a very important day for our uh, employees here at RTA. Uh, we are opening up the uh, workout room downstairs that you uh, did the ribbon cutting uh, last week, I think. And so it's, uh, it's gonna be a center open, I believe from uh, six to eight, uh, six to nine uh, every day. And they can utilize it um, before work, during work, lunch hour, or after work. Uh, so we're all excited. Uh, we have a, a group exercise classes uh, scheduled, nutritional classes. And then we also have a private Facebook uh, group for the employees. And then we're, we would have resources and rewards throughout the uh, Go 365 app. Be transformed, weight challenge begins today. So um, maybe you didn't notice, but I didn't need a taco this morning. So. Somebody <laughs> open the oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I ate the yogurt. But you know, when you, when you provide the when you provide the right tools to a mechanic and he has experience in it, he'll be a good mechanic. So. Uh, our team, uh, I'm proud of uh, our executive team, which we came to name the B team. Not that we don't want to be the eight, but it goes with our logo, the B team, second to none. And so this is our idea, and um, and hopefully, you know, we're, we're going to provide the right tools, the right counseling, the right uh, everything. So uh, we're going to challenge our, our employees to to join. And I think I'm excited, everybody is, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, you'll see a little bit less of me every, every month that I see you. <laughs> okay, and then for the mental wellness, uh, maintaining a respectful uh, workplace. Um, as you guys have seen and heard in, in, in the news, uh, uh, there were um, 39 uh, uh, incidents were uh, 69 uh, people throughout the United States got killed on, on um, just shootings and and everything has to do with with mental uh, illness. Um, back in October, November, uh, we we met the team met and and uh, I said, uh, how do we do something to um, um, be aware of what's going on uh, in the United States? and here uh, be proactive and, and doing something. So we came up with, um, I don't know if you noticed it, um, and during the holidays we put a Be Kind poster, and, and then as you can see in the bottom right is uh, Be Nice. And uh, so we started the, this idea as a group, and, and we're gonna get our employees and directors involved in this too, so give us ideas of what uh, what we should put on, on our next poster message, and we welcome that. Um, so we started this like what five months ago, and uh, just recently, I think this month, the APTA uh, group uh, started the same thing. Uh, what we're doing, so it's it's out there, and we are hoping to um, be nice. <laughs> To everybody in the workplace, there's you know some it, it happens. There's bullying happening um, in the community at schools, and it's kind of focused in schools because you know that's where uh, a lot of it is happening. But it happens in the workplace too. So we want to make sure that our employees are, if they have any issue with anybody, uh, you know, make that notification to us, and and we'll we'll handle it appropriately. Um, so, you know. 
currently, uh, again, initiative to promote a respectful workplace and emphasize safety. Uh, new mental health wellness posters will be displayed monthly. And, uh, and then, uh, like I said, APTA recently just began the same campaign. Um, we are the group. Uh, we we're talking Angelina, uh, Sharon, uh, Rita, uh, Derek, and Robert, and myself, and also Marisa who is part of the executive team that uh, we sit down and, and forecast and talk about issues. Also, how to make RTA better or workplace. And if, and if we do that and our employees see it from, from leadership, I think it's gonna go a long way. So we, uh, again, we welcome the, um, the directors to sign in on this uh, uh, project also. And if there's any uh, assistance that the employee have, you know, there's a number and uh, it's available for all employees and dependents. So great um, idea, B team, press on. So uh, community focus, uh, Nueces County Junior Livestock Show had the parade uh, earlier uh, on January the 14th. Uh, just uh, County Scott uh, wrote in one of our beautiful <laughs> As you can see, uh, golf carts there, and then Commissioner uh, Jim Bright al also was in, in the area, and he, he used, utilized the other uh, golf cart. Then we had the uh, NAACP MLK Freedom Fund Gala, well attended, great speaker, uh, Jeremy Coleman, yeah. uh, good selection. And then uh, MLK Commemorative uh, March Park and Ride, uh, we had uh, a bus, uh, uh, picking up uh, the uh, people who participated in the march. And I can, if you can see in the picture down there below, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Armando, for participating in the walk with your family. It was great. I, don't, I, I, didn't, uh, I don't know if, if I missed anybody, uh, uh, directors. I'm sorry. I just we saw him and somebody, uh, Jeremy, jumped out there and took a picture. Great, great job, Jeremy. And then also we also had the mayor and. Um, Councilman uh, Mike Pusley there uh, participating in that in that walk. Then the Hector P. Garcia um, Memorial Foundation luncheon well attended from staff and some of the directors. And then we had the CCISD uh, School Expo uh, marketing continues to do outreach uh, and, and teach them of the Go, Go Path ad and our services, ADA um, transportation. So. Um, great job in marketing department in helping us uh, communicate that message uh, in this community. Then Habitat for Humanity, uh, a 2023 uh, strategic plan and presentation by uh, Director Coleman. And then United Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, last week um, had their ga gala. And uh, thank you, Director Salazar, for attending and your guests. This is good right here. Again, uh, being involved in the community, uh, positive influence uh, throughout the uh, Rob 28. We had challenges, as you guys know, and especially uh, Director Allison, who has helped us and and um, uh, do something uh, how we can service uh, that area. And uh, through the uh, combined efforts of CCRTA board of directors, staff, uh, and operations, uh, planning. Um, Director of Transportation, everybody involved, uh, CCRJ, we were able to uh, adjust uh, Route 28 for service. Uh, also, CCRJ is providing service to Metro Minnesota despite continued heavy uh, construction in that area. Just a couple of days ago, they closed it down okay. because it, that it wasn't just. Us. That no, wasn't no, us. <laughs> not pointing fingers or even looking at you. Yes. And so that happens. And so when, when that happens, you know, uh, Director uh, uh, Derek in, in operations uh, gets involved and Director of Transportation, immediately we, we, we uh, reroute the, uh, uh, the route. Uh, so it's a challenge. And because it's a challenge, we, do we give up? No, uh, we make it happen as best as possible. So again, uh, the CEO, uh, Patty Clark, is extremely grateful for the collaboration effort and the role of our RTA has played in assisting the, the community. 
Operations and projects updates. Uh, ridership increased uh, 41% from last year in January 2022. 20, uh, uh, we hired uh, four uh, new employees, three operators, and uh, and a um, intern in marketing. Does he start today, Rita? Right? Today's his first day. Good. And then our shelter expansion, Sharon, um, she's um, has has done well in 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 making sure that you know the the shelters come in and then with the, within a couple of weeks they're they're put out. So we're getting like 40 a month, and uh, thus far we we've installed 200 of those. And I'm pretty sure you guys have seen them at night, especially when the lights are there. Very important uh, for for safety. And then uh, where we'll be installing uh, again 375. Uh, within the uh, next couple of years. So for 40 additional shelters have arrived and like I said, uh, have been installed and great job sharing. Keep up the good work. In Del Mar College, 40%. Um, it, it took us it's coming along. 10 months to get 40%, right? Because you, you gotta get the land, you gotta get the permission, then uh, the um, go through the city of Corpus Christi, engineering, all that. So is it gonna take, what, 12 months to finish the 60%? No. It's, it's difficult just to get to the 40%, right? So hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll finish that 60%. And Sharon is going out there like once, two times a, a week to make sure that it's on, on target. And uh, it's, uh, it's her team and herself doing that, and we appreciate that. Then for Del Mar College, also Creek Construction, uh, like I said, is, it's uh, going well. And then the Port Ayers, this is exciting. The, the Port Ayers uh, station construction, uh, procurement already put it out uh, about a week ago, right, Robert? Yeah, about a week ago. And then we will bring it back to you in March, next month, in the uh, committee, uh, operation committee meeting to, to uh, uh, award a contract. And then the upcoming events uh, was supposed to be in Austin after this meeting for a board meeting, but it was canceled uh, due to weather. The, the, the highways and streets are super dangerous to, to drive, so they canceled that to, for next month. And then uh, Saturday, uh, Rose Park's birthday, you can see on the right, uh, we have a poster that is uh, being displayed on, on all our uh, buses. And then on the 22nd, uh, Coastal Bend Day in Austin, uh, 23rd and 25th, there's a, a SWATA conference in Aurora, Cali Cali uh, Colorado. And then March 5th through the 8th, uh, a TTA Legislative Conference in Austin. And just um, for the uh, directors, this is a, an important uh, trip, March the 11th through the 15th, uh, <coughs> Legislative Conference in Washington, D.C. That's where we take our request projects and visit our, our senators and our representatives to hopefully uh, persuade them to give us funding for our buses and everything else that we need, uh, bus facilities. Any question, guys? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Item 17, board chair report. Um, as per usual, we'll de defer to the, each director to give comments or feedback. We'll start with Director Woolbright. Great job, team. Good job, keep it up. Ditto. <laughs> good, good job. There's a, I see a lot of positive movement, um, a lot of uh, activities in the community, and, and just you know, having great impact in the community is uh, I'm able to see and share the things that I'm doing. Thank you. Continued good job <coughs> on the um, contracts. I said it three times, so hopefully it'll you mean. continue to uh, move in that direction. Uh, Mr. Rudon, thank you for sending your staff to that strategic uh, <coughs> habitat um, a meeting. That was um, hopefully really impactful, but I appreciate you getting them there at the last minute so that you were well represented there, sir. Uh, yeah, just great job uh, to the to staff, to the whole team. It was great to recognize some of our staff members this morning, our, our safety staff. Uh, so kudos once again to them. Uh, special shout out real quick. 
uh, when we were up in Austin, we met with Senator Morgan La Mantilla, and uh, we told her, hey, we're from Corpus Christi RTA. And she was like, yeah, adelante, right? And we were just like, well, you know about us? That's cool. That's so cool. Like, so special shout out to Rita and you know everyone in the marketing team. You know, obviously, uh, kind of last month, it's always great to see people from the outside of the RTA. What we do here, kind of sing our praises. And so, so all the way from from Austin, Texas. So thank you so much for that. We really appreciate all the hard work that the whole team does. So thank you so much. Yeah, I when we got back, uh, before we got back, I, I told Rita about that. Knowing uh, uh, Morgan a, a little bit, uh, I, I told her it's great things where uh, you can find great things about a company or a person in Google. She started laughing. Yes, that's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> But again, Rita uh, and, and, and the uh, B team, thank you for, for being part of this great movement that we have here at RTA in the last four or five months. Thank you, everybody. We're going to adjourn the meeting at 10. We have well, Anna. I'm sorry? Director. Oh, I'm sorry. Director Canales. I'll go back. Do you have any comments? Oh, no, just uh, everybody, great job and happy to be part of the B team. Thank you. Hope you're feeling better. <laughs> well, I didn't want to go get it, give anybody what my son gave me. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> okay, meeting adjourned at 1013 a.m.